This, is, this video is to talk about the t-distribution. The t-distribution is a um, re relative to the normal distribution. It was discovered in um, the 1800s and um, published uh, publications were written about it in 1908 by a man named Gossett. And Gossett was working for Guinness Brewing Company. And when he was working there, he was taking samples from the um, product and he was doing statistical testing on it. What he noticed was very consistent discrepancy in these small samples that he was taking to what he expected to see in a normally distributed random variable. And due to these small discrepancies, he discovered a new distribution and then in 1908 published what he had found. So this new distribution we come to find is related to the normal distribution. It has many characteristics that the normal distribution has. However, it has some very particular characteristics as well. So let's go over the characteristics of the t-distribution. First of all, the t-distribution is a symmetric bell-shaped distribution, just like the normal distribution. It is smaller, um, it has smaller sample sizes, when it has smaller sample sizes, it has fatter tails and it is wider and flatter. So if I were to look at a normal distribution, I might see a normal distribution look more like this. But if I'm going to look at the t-distribution um, in with respect to this, I might see something that is a little bit more like this and the bar, bar being down here. See, these are now wider and the whole distribution looks a little flatter than this. And that's a characteristic of the t-distribution. The t-distribution has three parameters instead of two. It has the mean and the standard deviation that we're used to with respect to the normal, but it also has another called the degrees of freedom. Now degrees of freedom in very simple terms can be labeled as df, and there is also a Greek letter that represents the degrees of freedom as well. And that degrees of freedom is this Greek letter which is called nu. And degrees of freedom are just the sample size minus one or n minus one. Now another thing that you should note is that as the degrees of freedom become large or as the sample size becomes large, and I use quotes around the large here because um, that kind of varies in where this actually happens, but as they become large sample sizes, the um, distribution becomes a, t a Z distribution. So with that in mind, we're just going to figure out, well, why would we use this normal distribution? or this t distribution rather than the normal distribution. So we're going to go over here and we're going to um, look at a table from our um, Bioga material. And we're going to see this flow chart here. And so what you see is if I'm going to create a confidence interval for mu, then I'm going to check on the sample size to decide whether I'm going to use the z or whether I'm going to use the um, t. So if I have a sample size of 30 or larger, now some people are a little bit more conservative on this and they just go strictly for it must be greater than 30, but the oak is being relatively um, generous here and saying 30 or bigger. So 30 or bigger, we're just going to use a z with the yoga material. And anytime the sample size is less than 30, we're going to use the t. Now do be careful of this if you're using material other than Bioga and watching my video. Um, there are some more conservative um, restrictions put on this and you need to be careful of that. Um, but for Bioga this is the, the flow that we're going to use. Now, so if n is less than 30, that's when we're going to create a confidence interval using this t distribution. So once more as a recap here, if we see that n is greater than or equal to 30, then we're going to be using the normal distribution. If we see that our n is less than 30, then we're going to be using our t distribution. Now when I say the normal, I see mu and sigma divided by the square root of n. Remember alternately, Bioga says that s or sigma. Again, other materials may be a little bit more conservative than Bioga, so watch that if you're using this video in conjunction with some other material. And when we have the t-distribution, we have the degrees of freedom, we have the mu, and we have this s divided by the square root, 
of n or alternately the sigma um, according to the Biogo material. Now, as we move on forward here, um, we're going to go ahead and develop the um, confidence interval for a t um, random variable, just like I did for a normal random variable if you've watched my um, development of a confidence interval. So we're going to say that our probability of a negative t and a positive t um, being between, um, or a t being between a negative t and a positive t, equaling a 0.99 um, probability, that this is what it looks like, just like it would for a normal, right? It looks exactly like a normal. And indeed, the t works just like the z. We can standardize it. So we have a t with any mean, any standard deviation. It can be standardized just like a standard normal random variable by subtracting its mean and dividing by um, the standard deviation, or in this case, the standard error, because we're concerned with x bars when we're creating a confidence interval. So I put the zero here in the middle. So here's our picture of what's going on, our 0.99 smack dab in the middle to create this confidence interval. So the two t values that create a 99% probability right here in the middle, which leaves the 0 0.05, a 0, 0.05 in each of the tails. So we need a t value for the 99% confidence and a sample size of 10. So I need the additional information of how big the sample is in order to find a critical value for a t. So down here, what you see is you see this information. You see that I am going to find this t critical value based upon the degrees of freedom and based upon the one tail information, right, the area in one of the tails. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look at my um, t table here. And you saw me use the t table if you looked at my... Um, and my information on inverse normals as well. But the t-table is set up to give us critical values. It's based upon area in a one tail, probability in one tail, or alternately the area in both of the tails, and the degrees of freedom over here along the edge. So for me to find t-value with nine degrees of freedom, sample size minus one, and 0 .005 in one of my tails, I'm gonna go here, and I will locate the area in one of my tails, 0 0.05. I will go to the degrees of freedom here, and I will, in addition, locate the 9 degrees of freedom. And now I can find what my um, critical value is. It's 3.25. Now notice all the values in this t-table are positive values, but the t-distribution is symmetric just like the normal distribution, and therefore we know that if we found a positive one, we've got the same negative value um, on the opposite side of the distribution. So our value that we're going to put in here is 3.25. Now before I leave this, I'm going to also point out to you that the area in the two tails here, that would be our 1 minus our confidence level, right? 1 minus the confidence interval would be 0 0.01. And you'll notice that an area in two ta tails here, comparable to the one tail area 0 0.05 is 0 0.01. Those two agree with one another. So technically, if you're finding um, a symmetric interval, finding the critical value can either be done based upon a one tail or based upon a two tail. tail. But what I caution you there is that as we move toward hypothesis testing, it's really better to be thinking in terms of one tails rather than two tails because a, a hypothesis test isn't always symmetric. All right, now let's go ahead and de derive this confidence interval based upon the t distribution. So just like before, I'm going to pull out this right in here to derive this interval. So I'm going to have a negative 3.25, and that's less than the t, which is less than a positive 3.25. Now from there, I'm going to replace the t with the standardized value. So negative 3.25 is less than my x bar minus my mu, divided by my s, divided by the square root of n. And that is less than 3.25. Now, solving this compound inequality, I'm going to multiply both sides by s, divided by the square root of n, so negative 3.25, multiplied by s over the square root of n. And then, that now is less than x bar minus mu, so x bar minus mu, 
which is less than and 3.25 and again multiplied by s times the square root of n. Because remember when you solve a compound inequality you multiply this number by this middle to get rid of it and then that has to be done on the left and on the right. Now my next step is to get rid of the x bar so I'll be subtracting x bar from here, here, and here. So x bar is minus x bar and then minus and then my 3.25 times s over the square root of n and then less than my negative mu was less than and then my negative x bar and then plus 3.25 and then times s times the square root of n. Now the next thing and last thing I need to do before the flip-flop is that I need to get rid of this negative right here. So I'm going to multiply here, here, and here by a negative. So when I multiply by a negative this becomes a positive x bar. This becomes a positive 3.25 times s over the square root of n. Don't forget that when I multiply by a negative, the inequality must reverse. That becomes a positive. Again, the inequality reverses when I multiply by a negative. And now I have positive x bar and a negative 3.25 times s divided by the square root of n. And now the last piece of the puzzle is to do the pancake flip-flop that I call this. And I'm going to put the large one and the small one on the correct places so it is in standard form. So the right side becomes the left and the left becomes the right. And the inequalities will reverse so it's in standard form. And this is now, oops, that was an N. This is now going to be my inequality, which is also known as the confidence interval. And now what you're seeing in here is the t value instead of a z value. And you see it's just like when we develop that for a normal random variable. Remember that this interval can also be written as x bar plus or minus, and then it would be 3.25 times s divided by the square root of n. And that's another way of writing our confidence interval. And then once we had calculated values, we could also write it in interval notation, parentheses, and then comma, and then the number and the other number. So we would have some number here, x bar plus this value, comma, x bar minus, or excuse me, x bar minus on this side, x bar plus on the right side, and then ending that. So those are the three different ways that we could write it. Now I'm not going to give a numeric example here, but that's the derivation using a very specific value of t. It would work for any particular value of t, but I wanted to make sure that we understand how to use our, our t table and then how this is derived just like how the confidence interval for a z is derived, or for a mean using a z distribution is derived.